the bright side of addiction is recovery. And recovery is an American way of life. Now, if you're in recovery or you know or love someone who is or you simply want to know more about the recovery process or maybe you're a bit concerned about someone you know or love, this is the podcast for you as we carry the message of hope and the promise of recovery. And a reminder that you can find all of our podcasts at recoverycoasttocoast.org. Welcome to episode 56 of Recovery Coast to Coast. You know, to be human is to experience shame, and vulnerability is strength. Now, today on Recovery Coast to Coast, the national podcast, those are the words of one of America's leading researchers on shame, Brene Brown. She is the author of six number one bestsellers on the New York Times bestseller list. Brene sat down with me at the annual Addiction Studies Conference in Columbus, Ohio. We talked about shame and vulnerability. Here is a quick clip from today's interview. It's a tough word. I mean, the three things I can tell you after spending a decade studying shame, the three things I can tell you about it is we all have it. We're all terrified to talk about it. And the less we talk about it, the more we have it. Shame is the intensely painful feeling or belief that we are flawed and unworthy of love and belonging. Following our chat with Brene Brown, we'll meet a woman who has been in continuous recovery six years. Now, she had an intervention that was organized by two family members and five friends. Unlike many interventions that can be filled with denial before acceptance takes hold, this particular intervention was a huge success from the get-go. Now, when it was over, she said, all right, let's do it, and immediately had an assessment and checked into an inpatient program, followed by 90 meetings in 90 days. Here is a quick clip from my conversation with Sharon Hannon. I feel so lucky. I am such a lucky person with what I have. Every day I I say life is a gift. It is such a gift. I'm full of gratitude all the time for that I get to wake up. I, I just feel like I'm not explaining this well, but I really live my life full of gratitude. I just feel like every day is such a gift, and we don't know what's happening tomorrow. So let's just, like, make the best of today. And I really honestly live like that every single day, and I just couldn't be any happier in my life. And we will close out the podcast with some thoughts on mental health recovery and the importance of seeking help. A few days ago, Jason Sudeikis, the star of that hit comedy Ted Lasso, love Ted Lasso, met with President Biden at the White House. He is an outspoken advocate for mental health. We'll share his remarks with you as well as he stands tall in reducing stigma associated with mental illness. I'm Neil Scott, host of Recovery Coast to Coast, and I want to begin by saying thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to our podcast. Now, I realize your time's important. There are a lot of podcasts out there. Thank you for listening to ours. Our website, recoverycoasttocoast.org. Following 15 years of nightly broadcasting on iHeartRadio in Seattle, our podcast features interviews with everyday people in recovery, as well as clinicians, authors, and recovering celebrities who offer the promise of hope and the reality of recovery plus well-vetted resources for individuals, families, and friends. We invite you to enjoy it and to share it with your friends as well. Recovery is an American way of life. Recovery Coast to Coast is supported by Sundown M Ranch. Sundown.org is their website. They're one of America's oldest, least expensive, and most successful treatment programs. Now, they've just celebrated their 55th anniversary as one of America's most well-respected treatment facilities. Sundown M Ranch is a private, not-for-profit organization that was established back in March of 1968 as the very first nonprofit residential treatment program for alcoholism and drug addiction. Sundown is situated on 30 acres at the mouth of the beautiful Yakima River Canyon, It's a serene setting for healing and recovery. They've treated some 200,000 adults, adolescents, and family members. 
They believe that recovery from addiction is a lifelong process, and that's why they help provide each patient with all the tools necessary for a lifetime of recovery. They don't just treat and release. Now, the philosophy of treatment at sundown is simple. Arrest the disease, provide needed support in the recovery process, and guide the individual back to a healthy and productive life. Their motto is, the patient is the reason we are here. A lot of treatment programs are profit-driven, not the case with Sundown. They are recovery-driven. The cost of treatment, which is covered by most major insurance policies, is all-inclusive, and their programs are open-ended based on the individual's patient needs. Don't be fooled by high-pressure advertising and marketing Trust a program that has been successfully treating folks for 55 years, one patient at a time. And if you know someone who is looking to find a really good treatment center, consider Sundown M Ranch. It is where recovery begins. Website, sundown.org. Well, as I pour a cup of coffee, I'd like to share with you my conversation with the amazing Brene Brown. She is one of America's leading authorities on shame, vulnerability, and empathy. Let's listen to my conversation with Brene Brown. Brene Brown is from the University of Houston, and she does a lot of work in terms of shame. And shame is something that's pretty familiar to people in recovery. But, you know, it's kind of a topic that may be difficult. Brene, welcome to Recovery Coast to Coast, and talk about the difficulty that some people have with shame. (laughs) I'm glad to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I'm laughing because when I first started doing this work, I guess a couple years into the work, I did a group with women um, who were all in recovery and also trauma survivors. And after the first meeting, we went, we got back together and one of the women in the group had clearly declared as the leader of the pack. And she kind of approached me before we started group and she said, We've been talking, which is never a good sign. Yeah. We've been talking and we're really struggling with how much you're saying the word shame. It's really uncomfortable. And of course, the problem was that, you know, it was a shame resilience group. (laughs) And so I said, well, what what do you, do you have any suggestions? And she said, we're thinking it might be better if we called it shame. If we could just refer to it as shame for the next couple of weeks until we got used to all the shame talk. (laughs) So I thought... I can do that. Wow. So really and truly, like, people, we have a visceral reaction to the word shame. Um, and it was, you know, it was great because people would be really processing. They'd say, you know, this happened with my sponsor, and I, I, I was in really deep shame, and, you know. <laughs> so, but, and then, you know, kind of graduation from group wow. was we, we owned the word. You know, we took it back. But it's a tough word. I mean, the three things I can tell you after spending a decade studying shame, the three things I can tell you about it is we all have it. We're all terrified to talk about it, and the less we talk about it, the more we have it. How do you define shame? Well, it's interesting because I'm a qualitative researcher, which means I come up with my definitions by collecting stories from people and asking them what it means to them. And so after interviewing many men and women, I came up with a definition that shame is the intensely painful feeling or belief that we are flawed and unworthy of love and belonging. Wow. What do you do with shame? What do you do with shame? You wince. Um, You know, here's the thing about shame. We really do all have it. We, We believe that shame is probably the most primitive human emotion that we experience. In fact, the only people who don't experience shame are folks who have no capacity for human connection. Mm. And so we're talking about kind of serious sociopathology. Mm -hmm. So we all have it. As long as we're capable of feeling connected, the fear that we'll do something or be something or fail to do something that makes us lovable will always be a part of it. But the great thing was, you know, in addition to doing the interviewing to understand more about shame, I found across my my interviews that men and women with high levels of resilience to shame share four things in common. And this was across all the men and women. And they are. And they are. The first one is, ironically enough, they understand what shame is and they know what triggers it. So for example, um, a shame trigger may be, you know, there are categories. It may be for women, the number one trigger for shame is still appearance and body image. Really? Absolutely. Um, Parenting, motherhood, health, addiction, money, sex, these Mm -hmm. are all triggers. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, the number one thing for men 
professional status and ID and identification, money and work. It's been very painful for me over the last year during this really difficult economic time, mm -hmm. interviewing men who are scrambling for work, scrambling to provide for their families, because that is just a huge shame trigger for men. And it's a shame trigger for women, but not as much. I mean, basically, triggers go back to two things, kind of the social cultural expectations, mm -hmm. which is absolutely mm -hmm. organized by gender, and the old family of origin stuff. Family of origin stuff. Yeah. You know, as you're talking, I'm thinking back to my grandmother when I was a small child, and I would do something wrong, she would say, shame on you. Absolutely. That was shame. And, and I never thought about that until we were just talking. And it, suddenly my grandmother came into my head and yeah. shame on you. You know, we have even intergenerational studies that show, like, our grandparents relied very heavily on shame in a parenting yeah. context. Our parents more than, less than them, but still. And we're getting better. The thing about shame that's really, I think, very helpful, helpful to understand and really can be life-changing is there's a tremendous difference between shame and guilt. The difference between shame is I am bad and the difference is the difference between I am bad and I did something bad. So I'll give you an ex Ooh, yeah. yeah. So I'll give yeah. you an example. You get really loaded, at, you know, on a Thursday night. You get to work late on Friday, you miss an important meeting, you're reprimanded. If your self-talk is god, I'm so stupid, I'm such a loser, I'm I'm just I'm an idiot. Shame. If your self-talk is, I can't believe I did that. That was a really stupid thing. I can't believe that, mm. you know, guilt. And what we know now from about 30 years of research is guilt moves us toward change. It, guilt is uncomfortable, but it moves us toward thinking, this is inconsistent with who I want to be. I'm not going to do that again. I'm not gonna, I need to make amends. I right, need to make a right, change. Right. Shame, on the other hand is far too blunt of an instrument. It's like hitting a thumbtack with a 500 pound anvil. Mm -hmm. It basically corrodes our belief that we can be better. Mm. Very dangerous tool. What do you do with the shame? Well, the four elements are understanding mm -hmm. shame and what triggered it. Right. Um, the next one is practicing critical awareness. Men and women with high levels of shame resilience can really reality check the messages and expectations. Mm -hmm. You know, so as a woman, you know, in the morning, it's very, it's, it's not uncommon to stand up in the morning in front of a mirror and go, oh my God, old, fat, tired, you know, and women with high levels of shame resilience can say, and there's a $60 billion industry banking on me feeling this ugly today, Ooh. you know, and I'm not going to do it. Wow. And men can reality check, I am not what I make. I am not the coming partner. I'm not the next promotion. I'm more than that. I am enough. I'm a human being, I'm not a, a human doing. That's it. That's it. So that's the second piece. So understanding shame, reality checking. And this is the biggest piece, is sharing our story. Which people in recovery are, are good at doing. We're good at doing. We're absolutely good at doing. Mm. Mm. We have to be able to share the story, and we have to be able to speak shame. We have to be able to call shame, shame. It's really important. You know, if I called you up and say, hey, it's Brene, you're not going to believe what happened at work. I'm so embarrassed. That feels very different than if I called and said, I'm in deep shame about something that happened at work. Mm. We need to be able to say the word, and I'll tell you what's been shocking for me, honestly. The number, I've probably, I guess I've probably talked to maybe 10, 15,000 mental health and addiction professionals in the last few years. The number one question that I still get from professionals is, do I have to use the word shame? The number one question I get from lay people mm. is, why in the hell hasn't anyone ever named this for me? There's a disconnect. We're, yeah, a real disconnect. We're afraid to talk about it because shame is not, if you come see me and you're my client, shame is not something that, oh, I know all about that, I can help you with it. Mm -hmm. I've got it. Mm -hmm. We all have it. We all have it. You know, it, to be human is to experience shame. So I think, you know, we live in a culture, I think, that tells us that vulnerability is weakness. And, and I, I just disagree with that wholeheartedly. I really believe that our vulnerabilities... Is vulnerability strength? I think vulnerability is strength. I think the reminders to our head and to our heart to stay open to the fact that we're all in this together. Mm. You know, it's all of us. And, you know, I, I talk a lot in my work about the word courage um, and that it takes a lot of courage to be honest about our shame. And the beautiful thing about the word courage is that the Latin word that is the origin for courage is cur, and it means heart. And when courage first came into the English language, it had a completely def different definition than it does today. The definition was originally to tell your truth 
with all of your heart to share your story. That's nice. And so what I think vulnerability mm. is, isn't that beautiful? Yeah, it really is. I mean, it's really, I think, about having the courage to say, you know what? I grabbed my kid by the top of the arm today and just raged. Mm. And to have someone sitting across from me who can respond to courage mm. with compassion and say, I get that. It's not okay, but I get it. I understand. I understand. Brene Brown joining at Recovery Coast to Coast, keynote speaker here at the 19th Annual Addiction Studies Institute. She has a, she has a book out, which is called I Thought It Was Just Me, But It Isn't. It, 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 it really isn't just me. <laughs> it's really not. It's just all of us. Yeah, all of us together. Yeah. The Gifts of Imperfection, and that's such a marvelous title. I'm excited. Imperfection is a gift, isn't it? Oh, man. Are you kidding? Perfection? Is it, uh, perfection, uh, perfectionism, you know, is one of the most dangerous things I think I've ever studied because wow. it's addictive. Yeah. And what it is, it's a belief system that says, if I do it perfect, live perfect, and live, look perfect, I can avoid judgment, blame, and shame. Mm. And the problem is you can never do it perfect. You can never And you there. can never avoid those things because they're part of the wow. human experience. Yeah. Well, even in 12-step programs, you know, we are taught progress, not perfection. Amen. Progress. Yeah. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that's the bar yeah. <laughs> for me. <laughs> Absolutely, because you know it, everybody can relate to that in different ways. But when you talk about perfection, that that is, it's unattainable. Yeah, and it's so seductive. It's really. In our society, you're absolutely yeah. right. I mean, it's everywhere you look, and, and it just doesn't exist. Brene Brown joining us tonight. The keynote address is Authenticity, Addiction, and Chame. And Chame, baby. <laughs> I like it because it rhymes with Brene. I Brene's going to talk about some Chame. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> today uh, or, or tomorrow, as the case Touché. may be. Yeah. Okay, we got to <laughs> stop, and, seriously. And on and on we go. <laughs> talk about authenticity. What is that? You know, so after a decade of studying shame, I, I kind of flipped all my data, you know, over and thought, okay, so I know what shame is. What exists in us when it's, when it's not controlling our lives? And what I found is hmm. that I think the journey that we're all on, really, is to live with authenticity, a sense of love and belonging, and a resilient spirit. I think these are the three big things that we're after. Um, you know, and the litmus test for me is I have a four-year-old and a ten-year-old, and if I, could want, if I could wish three things for them in their lives, it would be that they're comfortable in their own skin. Yeah. They have a sense of authenticity. They have a sense of love and belonging. We spend so much time trying to fit in that we completely miss out on belonging. The two are mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. Fitting in is assessing who I'm supposed to be, and we're all really good at that. What do I need to dress like? What shoes do I wear? What politics do I talk about? Which do I avoid? What topics do I bring up? How do I act so I can fit in? Belonging is showing up and just allowing ourselves to be deeply seen and known. And you know, if it's not a fit, that's okay because we were true to ourselves. And that's a lot easier to manage than to walk away and say, oh God, can I keep this up the next time I'm here and the next time I'm here and the next time I'm here. And part of that has to be vulnerability. It's vulnerability. It's absolute vulnerability to allow ourselves to mm. be seen and known. Mm. It's a risk. How do you get from here to there? A person who is in recovery, who had a traumatic childhood, who is dealing with a lot of those childhood issues, how does that person get from there to being vulnerable, being okay in their own skin? You know, I think it's a journey. I think it's kind of like the North Star. I think we spend our lives walking toward it. I'm not sure that we ever get there mm -hmm. and touch it. I, I know that I probably won't in my life, but we take small steps toward it. And I think we do that by, you know, I think having a community with whom you can tell your story is really important. Mm -hmm. And one of the, you know, really bad message that we get in our culture is that all of us should have, you know, 25, 30 friends, you know, this big, you know, posse that we run around with. If you have one person, yeah, you know, one person, that's a gift, that's a gift who loves you, not despite your strengths, but because of your strengths and struggles, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. the whole package. they get the whole package. Yeah. You yeah. know, we joke around and say, you know, a friend called me one day and she said, I just want to let you know that you're a friend who would move a body. And I thought, Oh God, what does that mean? And she said, <laughs> I've just killed my yeah, husband. No, we need to move right. no, A no, friend no. called her and said that her mother was visiting. Her mother really struggled with alcoholism, was actively drinking. She'd passed out in the living room. It was three mm. o'clock. The kids were coming home. And she had called this friend of mine, sister, and said, can you help me move my mom before my kids get home? Mm. 
And my friend who called me said, I just want you to know that I would call you because I know you'd come and you wouldn't judge. Mm. And the next day when you saw my mom, you would look at her with the same kind of mm. respect mm. and love and you would never sell me out oh. to our friends. You know, yeah. Of course, the time, of course, the next, that was so moved by that that I called another friend of mine and said, hey, I just want to let you know that you're a friend who would move a body. And my friend went, oh crap, you killed somebody, didn't what you? What have you done, yeah. Renee? But I mean, one friend. Oh, yeah. And to share yeah. our story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, You know, and just say. And I think mm. for people on that journey, this truth I can share with you from doing this work for, again, a decade Everybody has a story mm -hmm. that will break your heart. Yeah. You know, we're really not alone. Yeah. It's part of the human experience. Yeah, we all have a story to tell. We all are who we, yeah. uh, we have been. And we're enough. Yeah, yeah. This is it. We're enough. Is, is, there, is there something that can be done in therapy to advance the goodness, the, the place that we want to be at? Absolutely. I absolutely think. And I think... You know, well, I, and I'll say this, and not just because this is your audience, I think of all the groups that I talk to, the folks in recovery are the most open to talking about shame mm -hmm. um, because it comes up in our rooms. It comes up in the yes, rooms, yes. you know, and in some rooms more than others. But I do think that it's possible through therapy and through, and I think group is extremely powerful because shame happens between people, mm -hmm. so it heals between people. Um, and so I do think it's absolutely possible. And I do think having an open conversation about shame is incredibly important. We, we, I have a curriculum that I wrote that's available through Hazleton and it's for mental health and addiction professionals who talk about the work. And when we do the outcome research on it and we ask people, what was the most helpful thing for you? I'm shocked every time we do it because there's always two answers. Just knowing that there's a word to define this feeling that washes mm -hmm. over me mm -hmm. and makes me want to disappear, die, mm -hmm. and knowing the difference between shame and guilt. Mm -hmm. You know, it's all right if we feel intensely uncomfortable when we make choices or have made choices that are inconsistent with what, who we want to be. Mm -hmm. It's okay to say, I've made a mistake. It's not okay to say, I am a mistake. Mm -hmm. None that, of us are that. That's a huge difference. Huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if people can realize that and separate that out, that's the first step. Oh, it's a huge step. Yeah. It's yeah. a huge step. Yeah. And then there's, there's Connections, a 12-session shame resilience curriculum. Who is that for? It's really for mental health professionals and addiction professionals who are running groups or working with individuals, families, and couples. And so if you're an addiction professional and you're interested in integrating shame resilience in your work, I think it's a, a really great curriculum. And we're going to actually have a national training on it in September in Houston. And you can learn more about that at my website. Is, is there resistance on the part of counselors? Because, I mean, again, we, we're all facing shame. Right. Do counselors say, uh, I don't think I want to deal with that part? God, yeah, they do. Mm -hmm. You know, we do. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you why. Let's say you and I are sitting together in a room. Okay. And you're my client and I'm the therapist. And you start to talk about something that really brings up shame for you. My shame will be triggered just mm -hmm. seeing mm -hmm. you in it. Mm -hmm. And when shame creeps into a room, it will go after the neck of the therapist first because if it can take down the clinician. That's visual. Yeah, That's it can take down it, it can take down the whole thing. So what happens is in order for me to say, I can hold this space for you. Tell me what your shame mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. I have to know mm -hmm. myself. Mm -hmm. And so what I tell therapists all the time, addiction professionals across the board, you've got to do this work before you can do this work. Mm. And so, because otherwise you can't hold the space. Yeah, yeah. Talk about the role of, of honesty in shame. You know, it's interesting. I write about honesty and I thought it was just me because obviously I'm a big believer and I think that, you know, Maya Angelou has a, a quote that said, there's no burden that's more painful to bear than a story untold. You know, we've got to be able to share our stories. Mm. You know, Show me someone mm. who wants to be defined by the worst thing they've ever done. Mm. None of us. But a lot of times shame makes us feel it's who we are and it's not. Mm. So I think honesty is extremely important in the pursuit of shame resilience. I think brutal honesty is brutal. And so often mm. people in our lives can use honesty as a weapon of shame. You know, mm -hmm. and I'll give you an mm -hmm. example. I was interviewing a woman who said that she struggles a lot because she had a new boyfriend who would 
after sex, compare her with other people he had slept with. And when she would say, that's really hurtful, he would say, I'm just being honest. You know, and so when... That's a dagger. Yeah, and so when you use honesty, we just yeah. honesty is important, but make sure that honesty has a soul, you know, and it has a heart, and it, it can be used as a weapon. And so one of the things that, you know, I always tell people is if you're using honesty with integrity, you can never go wrong. If you're using it as a weapon, then you're shaming people. And I'll, and I'll tell you this for sure, that as painful as it is to talk about the times when we've experienced shame, it is equally, if not more painful, than to acknowledge that all of us have perpetrated shame, myself included. You know, It's really easy to do, especially when we're in pain. It's really easy to lash out, especially the people we love the most, our partners, our kids, mm -hmm. people with whom we have power over, our employees, yeah. students. To come into an awareness of how shame works and how it operates in our lives, by nature, changes who we are. Brene Brown joining us on Recovery Coast to Coast, a keynote presentation here at the Addiction Studies Institute. She has a book out. Uh, you can find out more about her. I thought it was just me, but it isn't. Telling the truth about perfectionism, inadequacy, and power. You have a website? I do. I have it's it's www.brenebrown.com and I also have a blog and I will tell you that earlier this year I did a two month read along on my blog of my book. So I did a podcast every week for every chapter. Outstanding. Isn't that fun? Oh, that's I thought you'd love that as a radio I, I guy, love it, right? Absolutely. And so you can go on and you can get I thought it was just me oh, wow. and then read the first chapter, listen to the podcast, their art projects, oh, all kinds of neat stuff. So that's outside, I really encourage you to do it. That's outside the box. It's I love it. Yeah. I absolutely love it. It's great. It. Brene is truly amazing. And you can find out more about Brene Brown at her website, brenebrown.com. And if you go to YouTube, you'll find many of her TED Talks as well. From Brene Brown, we move to the reality of recovery for a woman who totally acknowledged her disease from the very beginning. And today, she still embraces her recovery, one day at a time. Sharon Hannon recovers out loud, without shame or guilt. Take me back uh, a little bit beyond the six years you have been in recovery. What led you into the rooms? Oh, I'll tell you. What led me into the rooms is I had an intervention with my two sisters and five of my closest friends. My ex-partner from California flew up, unknowingly to me, and I was at my sister's in Tacoma, and my other sister was there from Portland, and one sister was going to spend the night with me in Seattle, and the other one said, I'm coming, I'm coming up to Seattle too. And I said, well, why are you coming? You don't really need to come. Oh, oh, I'm just coming. And I said, well, but I don't get it. And Janet said, this, this is getting covered. We're all going up there. So I, I said, what is going on? And they said, oh, well, we're, we're, having an, we're going up and having an intervention with you. I said, oh, are we really? Oh. I said, are you the, my sister has her own mediation business. I said, oh, are you going to facilitate the meeting then, Karen? <laughs> she said, no, actually, Teresa, she's flying up, my ex. It's like, oh, then I thought, this is serious. So I met them all at my house on a Saturday, and seven people sat in my living room, and everyone told me a story how my alcohol had affected them. And I, and I, and I've been hiding and lying and not being honest for decades knowing I had an issue but I listened to everybody and I thought I have seven people in my life that love me enough to care and so they said we think you should go to treatment <laughs> I said absolutely because finally I can be honest finally they're in my it's like yes I said absolutely and they said well on Monday Phoebe's going to take you you got an appointment at four to get assessed and I said okay and so I went and got assessed and I was totally honest they said, think you need inpatient. I said, no problem. I couldn't wait to go. I'm serious. I was telling my landlord, was telling people, because finally, like this thing I've been hiding, my alcoholism, you know, it was like out in the open. And so then I went, I learned, oh, I'm such an alcoholic. <laughs> and, and I learned what it does to your brain and just your body. And I thought, oh, man. And I was like the model student. And the day I got out is exactly how I feel like today. I mean, it's crazy. Totally controlled my life. Where did you go to treatment? Milam. Ah, Lakeside Milam. Good program. Yeah. And I was working at the UW at the time. And so I 
could take a family medical leave and, you know, and I had insurance and I mean, I'm so fortunate. I mean, I won't even go there, but yeah, it's just, so yeah, I just, I came out and I did the 90 and 90. I did everything you're supposed to do. And I love AA. It was never like a, I I love it from day one because I I get to live who Sharon is now, you know, (laughs) it's not hide anymore and live a really honest, honest, honest life, which is, pretty amazing how bad did it get for you yeah. sharon um well it, obviously it got bad enough for me to have an event, intervention i did at one time get pulled over for a dui which i uh never got the dui went to outpatient and even then you know and and that was six years before i got sober you know i couldn't imagine not drinking i would uh forge my my slips at the meetings i mean was, you know for me I mean, my whole thing is like black and white. You're, you're an alcoholic, you're not an alcoholic, and I'm an alcoholic, and I just did what I had to do. So, but it never got so bad where I lost a job, or but obviously it controlled my life. I mean, I think about it daily. For you know, I, I hid, I snuck, I you know, I lied. You know. How old were you when you first got drunk? High school, and I was an athlete. I was a really great athlete. So, high. You know, it's interesting because I've just been going through boxes that I had stored for years at someone's home and I've gone through my whole life from like 20s 30s 40s 50s and then almost you know 63 and it's been so interesting and deep and thinking about my alcohol and 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 watching it transition it went from there to there to there to there and to where I was just dependent on it you know where I you know I would I had to have you know day I might think about it first thing in the morning I was a classic alcoholic Mm. Those seven people who did the intervention on you, how was your relationship with them now? And, and what was their reaction that you so willingly went into treatment? Because most people, you know, oh. no, nobody wakes up bright, sunshiny day and says, you know, I think I'll do something about my drinking. Uh, and there's usually there's denial yeah. and there's, you know, upheaval and all of that. But it sounds like you went right into the program. I went right into it because all those people are the closest people in my life. You know, my two sisters, I don't have my parents. I have my two sisters, you know, five of my closest deep friends, friendships. And for me, I don't want to, you know, I I look back from journals from decades, you know, got to quit drinking, got to quit drinking. So I knew I had a problem. And when I went in my face like that, it's like, Oh, wow. Yeah. And, And they were very surprised. I even made them dinner that night everybody dinner i wasn't upset I was, we all hugged and cried and it was like all a really happy thing and i was very open about it in the very beginning about going to treatment and sharing it with people just because i didn't want i wanted people to know who i am and i really love talking about alcoholism to people because you know it was shies away from it you know yeah. it's like so what i just love it you know i'm just it's how i've always been i'm just open and and if I can help people, awesome. And, you know, I've had numerous people come up to work privately and say, you know, you, you talk about, you know, meetings, you talk about, you know, could you give me some suggestions? Mm. I love that. You went so, into treatment on the 28th of November, which probably means you were in treatment over the holidays. I was in treatment over the holidays. Absolutely. What was, was that like? Well, it was fine because. My whole attitude was, it didn't matter if it's Christmas, what day is my birthday. It's like, I'm here because I want to be here. And that's what it is. That's what it is. It wasn't that big of a deal because I was so dedicated to the program. It didn't matter what was going to be going on. That was more important than Christmas. What was the first year like for you? The first year, oh, it was wonderful because I got to do the steps. You know, meeting with my sponsor and calling her every day and going through the steps, and she was fantastic. And I, it was such a growing, I mean, I'm still growing. I was so into AA. I was so into the book and, and the steps. I mean, that's, I mean, I always say everybody should, everyone should read that big book. It's such a way to live your life. I started filling my time with walking. <laughs> so now I walk eight to 10 miles every day. I, that's what I, that's what I do. Rather than drink, I just walk. And without headphones and just, I just, it's kind of my meditation. I love it. How did you go about finding a sponsor? I went to a meeting and close to my home, uh, knew somebody that I had known. I went with them and I started talking about dogs 
and this woman said, oh, I have a dog. We started chatting, chit-chatting about dogs, and she would 20, almost 20 years sober, and, and I asked her to be my sponsor. We just totally clicked, and turns out her name is Shannon Jean Shanahan, and I'm Sharon Jean Hannon. <laughs> <laughs> Like kind of like Sharon, you know Sharon. Yeah, yeah. Sharon is S H I R I N. I'm S H A R O N, and we both have the exact same birthday, five thirteen, nineteen sixty. I I think these those kind of things happen for a reason. I mean, that's just kind of how I live my life, and I just think take it when you have it. <laughs> I well, love it. What was it like doing ninety and ninety? You obviously went to different meetings. What did you learn in ninety and ninety? Oh, I learned about different kinds of, well, i tell you what I learned. I learned to be dedicated. You say you're going to do something. You say you're going to go to a meeting every single day for 90, 90 days and you do it. For me, I it was I was so dedicated to those. I didn't want to miss one. I did 90, 90. And different meetings. And then I learned about meetings. I hadn't gone to that many meetings. And so I learned about all different kinds of meetings. I went to women's meetings. I went to speaker meetings. I went to different kinds in different neighborhoods. You know, it's such a wonderful fellowship. I just, like, give me more. I can't have enough of them. <laughs> and of course, the beauty is no matter where you go, there are meetings anywhere on the planet. Everywhere. I went, I was in Thailand for my maybe second anniversary and I wanted to go to a meeting and I wanted to get a coin. So I, it was seven men seven American men, men, <laughs> all in their 60s. And I thought, that's fine. I kind of wanted more of a little culture, but it was fine. And then they said, well, we'd like you to lead the meeting. And what would you like to talk about? I said, oh, I really want to talk about gratitude. I said, it's just such a big, huge part of my life. And they said, well, you know, we really talked about that a lot the last couple of meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Could you maybe? <laughs> I thought, oh, can't have enough of gratitude. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was very funny. But yeah, yeah, everywhere around. I'm going to Indonesia in August. And I look forward to going to one in Jakarta. And wherever I go, I want to go to a meeting. And they're, they're pretty easy to find no matter where you are. They're so easy to find. Yeah. I mean, AA, it's incredible. I mean, even in Seattle, there's 1,500 meetings a week in the greater Seattle area. Every, every neighborhood. I mean, it's, it, uh, it, is, it is amazing. Did you do uh, continuing care with Lakeside after you get out of treatment? No. No, they, uh, they had, at one point they thought, said, oh, you might want to do the outpatient. I said, I'm pretty sure I don't need to do it, the outpatient. <laughs> so no, I didn't. Nope. I knew it. What did you learn in treatment? I learned that I, I'm definitely an alcoholic. <laughs> I learned what it does to your mind and your body. It scared, it scared me. I, I guess I learned that I'm an alcoholic. I learned what alcoholism is. I learned about alcoholism. And that is the disease, and I and that's how I look at it. That I have the disease. When you're in that first year, were there any temptations at all? Were there any slippery never. places that you found yourself in? Never, never. I mean, really, there's never. You know, I go to doctor to these people's homes, and there's always liquor around. Never, 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 ever. Because I knew. I mean, once that, once that day in that that my living room after then, it was, it was done. I was not. Mm -mm. Talk about service. Because it scared me, to tell you the truth. Oh, service. Oh, it's such a big part of my life. Service is a huge part of my life. My sister and I talk each week and say, what do you do for service, service this week? I do it daily. I'm not talking about doing service in meetings. I've done service in meetings before. But just I look to do things for people. When I think about service, I'm an example, I mean, yesterday I go out and pick some Daphne and I bring it to different people's homes. I mean, that's not service, but that's something that makes I do things for people. And to me, that is service, is, is just doing things for no reason at all. It makes me happy. Sharon, <laughs> what, what role does spirituality play in your ongoing recovery? Spirituality is big. I meditate every day. I really feel pretty physically, mentally, and spiritually. I feel very, very positive in all three of those. And I think they kind of go together. I guess my whole philosophy is I really live really presently and I just want to like today is today and let's make the best of today. And I guess the, the, the whole meditation of being quiet is kind of my spirit and then and being in the woods. So there's a, there's a lot involved in my spirituality, I guess. What do you say to, to a woman who has been in and out of the rooms and can't seem to get it? What I say, to tell you the truth, I say, you have to get rid of your guilt and shame. I don't think people go 
get stuck in that and you can't go anywhere. What's done is done. It's over and it's over. And I, I really you have to get rid of that stuff and move on. And, you know, and it worked. I, I, you know, I haven't had people come up to me, but that's what I would say. I would say you need to get rid of your guilt and your shame and move on. And today's a new day and it's worth living. Who's been the most influential person in your recovery? Oh, I would say my sponsor mm -hmm. early on. Yeah, I would definitely say my sponsor for and, sure. And you've had the same sponsor from the beginning? Yes. Wow. She was fantastic. How many? She did it by the book. <laughs> by the book and with the book, right? <laughs> yeah, I love the book. Yeah. How many meetings a week do you go to now, Sharon? I go to Sunday night. I go with three. Mm. I go to Sunday night speaker meeting, and then I do a Thursday home group, and then I do a um, neighborhood one at, at four. But how, yeah. How did you deal with the pandemic and meetings? Again, the first thing I thought during the pandemic, the first my first thought was, oh no, those poor people, those poor struggling alcoholics, they're going to be isolated, and they just can't get out. They're just going to be uh. so. I dealt fine. I did a lot of online meetings and I walked. <laughs> to me, the whole pandemic didn't, it didn't affect. I still was able to work. I could still walk. I could. It didn't really affect me very much, quite honestly. You know, of course, I missed the in-person meetings, but boy, it was fun going to different meetings in different countries. <laughs> I mean, I really had fun. I I would kind of have fun with it. To tell you the truth, it's like, oh, where do I want to check out a meeting today? Yeah. So I really, yeah, it was not a burden at all. You, you mentioned the importance of gratitude. Kind of expand on that a little bit, if you would. <gasps> what gratitude means to you as a grateful person in long-term recovery? I feel so lucky. I am such a lucky person with what I have. Every day, I, I say life is a gift. It is such a gift. I'm full of gratitude all the time for that I get to wake up. I, I just feel like I'm not explaining this well, but I really live my life full of gratitude. I just feel like every day is such a gift and we don't know what's happening tomorrow. So let's just like make the best of today. And I really honestly live by, like that every single day. And I, I just couldn't be any happier in my life. And I guess I'm just full of gratitude. I mean, my life is full of gratitude that I'm um, where I am. I mean, really, since quitting drinking six years ago, it has changed my life. I and mean, alcohol doesn't control me anymore. It, I get it control who I want to be, you know, without that alcohol. So I, I just feel full of gratitude that I, don't, that I don't have anything controlling me, but just me. It's very simple. <laughs> How is your recovery different today than it was when you first went into the rooms? How has that six years changed your life? Oh, God. I, what I always, what I always, I'm always growing. I always find like I'm learning something new, something new, something new constantly living those steps. So after I got sober, I, I totally changed my life about what makes me really, really happy and dogs. And I had a business. I mean, I was doing it before I got sober and then I thought, I'm going to make it a business. Wow. And um, so I got licensed and insured and I've been doing the exact same thing since I got sober. The exact same thing. And so I work 28 hours a week at uh, PZC to get my benefits and then I'm a do dogs and I couldn't be happier. I wanted my life to be as simple and, and stress-free and wow. do what made me happy. So it's so, I couldn't be happier so much. I feel pretty much exactly like I have six years ago. I mean, that's the funny thing. I, I, I've been like this from day one. I go to meetings to my home group. And they're like, you never change. I said, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's just, I'm just, this is my happy life. Living life on life's terms. Yeah. You know, I just, and I turned 60 a couple years ago. I think, I think this is my last third of my life. You know, I think 30, 60, 90. And it's like, you know, I just want to make the best of it and just, just be kind, man. I just want, it's so easy just for me to live a really happy life. And if I can help others, then wonderful. <laughs> That's how I look at it. I just want to spread it. You're recovering out loud. I am recovering out loud. I'm totally recovering out loud. And, you know, I'm very conscious that I'm I'm in recovery. I mean, I'm always going to be in recovery. I'm only six years. That's not very long. 
So I'm very conscientious about my recovery. I don't, not that I'd be triggered to drink, but it doesn't interest me to go to a, a bar anymore. Alcohol is just not around my life at all anymore. Mm. And and people want it. It's, I've been like this also from the beginning. If people want to drink around me, that's fine. Because, you know, if I really want to drink, I can go get it. So it doesn't really matter if someone drinks on me. I've always been like that. I often say that the bright side of alcoholism is recovery. And you certainly embody that, Sharon. Oh, thank you. I, I love recovery. You know, someone, I like someone that said it's easier to stay sober than get sober. I heard that at the meeting the other day, and I totally believe that for me mm, <laughs> so far. Mm. Well, I hope you have enjoyed our conversations with both Brene Brown and Sharon Hannon. And by the way, I want to remind listeners of this podcast, if you would like to share your story of recovery, regardless of the path that you've chosen, and as long as you have been in continuous recovery for at least one year or more, please drop us a note at recoverycoast2coast at comcast.net. Coming up next, we close out the podcast with a cult hero, Jason Sudeikis. He stars as the lovable soccer coach Ted Lasso on the Apple TV Plus series of the same name. The new season, by the way, has just started. A few days ago, he and members of the cast of Ted Lasso visited the White House, met with President Biden, and he met with the media as well. He shared his concern for mental health, urging people to recognize and deal with it and to talk about it free of shame. We'll share his remarks in just 30 seconds. Are you afraid? Afraid of life without drugs and alcohol? There is help and hope at Sundown M Ranch. At Sundown, the focus is on you and your disease. You will learn how to live without depending on drugs and alcohol. Sundown M Ranch is nationally recognized for effective and affordable alcohol and drug treatment programs. Reclaim your life. Replace your fears with hope. Go to www.sundown.org right now to learn more. All right, as promised, here's the very funny Jason Sudeikis, who has a very serious message. Don't be afraid to ask for help. He delivered that message at the White House just a few days ago. Uh, I just want to say that on behalf of myself, uh, everyone here with me today, and the numerous other folks that, that uh, it takes to make uh, our show Ted Lasso, it, it is sincerely an honor to visit the White House and to have the opportunity to speak to the President and to the First Lady about the importance of mental health. Um, so like, no matter who you are, no matter where you live, no matter uh, who you voted for, we all probably, I assume, we all know someone who has, uh, or have been that someone ourselves actually, that's struggled, that's felt isolated, that's felt anxious, that has felt alone, right? And it's actually one of the many things that, uh, believe it or not, uh, that we all have in common as human beings, right? And so um, that means that we, it, it's something that we can all, you know, and should talk about with one another when we're feeling that way or when we, when we recognize that in someone feeling that way. Uh, so please, you know, we encourage everyone, and, and this is a big theme of the show, is like to check in with your, you know, your neighbor, your coworker, your friends, your family, uh, and, and ask how they're doing. And, and listen, sincerely. You know, I mean, you all ask questions for a living, but you also listen for a living. So, you know, who am I preaching to? The choir, that is. Okay. Um, and look, and while, look, while it's easier said than done, I, I, we also have to know that we shouldn't be afraid to ask for help ourselves. And that, that does take a lot, especially when it's something that has such a, a negative stigma to it, such as mental health. And it, it doesn't need to be that way. And if you can ask for that help from a professional, fantastic. If it needs to be a loved one, equally as good in a lot of ways, because it's sometimes you just need to let that pressure, that, that pressure valve release. Uh, the president is working on, and his, and his own team, although his team is real, our team is make-believe. Uh, I don't think I don't know that. Despite what the people at FIFA and EA will tell you, we are actually a make-believe team. But, uh, you know, they're working very hard to make sure that, the, that, you know, that option is available to as many Americans as possible. Uh, now, look, I know in this town, uh, <laughs> a lot of folks don't always agree. Right, uh, and, and don't always feel heard, seen, listened to. Yes, but I truly believe that it, we should all do our best to help take care of each other. That's that's my own personal belief. I think that's something that everybody up here on stage believes in. That's, that's things we talked about in the writers' room, and we talk about in the editing room, and everything in between. Uh, and just like you know, we just want to emulate you know these make-believe folks that we all play at AFC Richmond, and and the way they take care of one, one another. That is the wish fulfillment of the show. Aside from me playing coach and these guys being professional footballers, you know, that's like you know, that's 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 a big part of the show. Uh, now I the I can't help but take this opportunity to take 
uh, at least one question. So please, yeah. Ah, wait, hold on here. Decorum, right? That was the word we were using, decorum. Uh, yes, sir, a familiar face. Hi. Fred Krim. <laughs> Fake journalist. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, uh, Trent, nice to see you. How do you feel about Kansas City being one of the named hosting cities for the uh, 2026 World Cup? Ooh, here I was hoping for a softball. Okay, um, you know what? I'm very excited, truth, truth be told. Yeah, Kansas City is going to be one of these teams. Uh, I mean, I love this town. What I am genuinely worried about is once we get all these folks from all over the world to come to Kansas City and see our city, eat our food, meet our people, you're going to have you know, a lot of folks that won't want to move away. That's what I'm worried about. Uh, that's it for us, all right? Thank you very much. All right, see you guys. Thank you sincerely so much for having us and, and putting up with us. Now on to uh, greener pastures. <laughs> Thank you so right, much. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, that wraps up this edition of the National Podcast, Recovery Coast to Coast. If you've enjoyed the podcast, do us a favor. Would you please share it with others via social media or simply tell somebody about it? You can find all of our podcasts at recoverycoasttocoast.org. You want to reach out to us? Our email address is recoverycoasttocoast at comcast.net. And please hit the subscribe or follow button. It's free and you'll be notified the next time we publish a podcast. Remember, if you know someone who is experiencing problems with alcohol or any other drug, here is a 24-hour national helpline. It offers free information and confidential treatment referrals. Spanish-speaking individuals are available as well. The number is 1-800-622-HELP. And join us next time for America's Voice for Recovery, Recovery Coast to Coast. And another shout out to our sponsoring organization, Sundown M Ranch, where recovery begins. Sundown.org. I'm Neil Scott reminding you to stay healthy, live in gratitude, and be kind to others. Remember, the bright side of addiction is recovery. Pass it on.